Hi everyone, this is Grace, and today I'll be walking you through how I made this Meaning of Easter set. This video is just over an hour, so buckle up, let's go. First up, we have this cross with shawl. Now, this is an edible marker, my friends, edible marker. <laughs> there are lots of options on Amazon. I believe this is Foodoodler. I'll try to make sure I link that in the description. If not, it's definitely in my Amazon shop. And I do like to use an edible marker when I have a design like this <laughs> where there's empty space um, and specific sections to be marking off. Now, these are, most of these cutters are, or most of these shapes, I should say, these designs are actually cutters that were designed, made by someone else, and um, I purchased them, <laughs> so I purchased the designs. Now, I did my own take on some of them, and I can walk you through how I changed them up, uh, but just so you know, these are kind of pre-made in a way. I mean, of course, I put my spin on them. I don't want to... <laughs> cheapen it at all. Um, so this cutter is by Kaleida Cuts. Most of the cutters um, here are from Kaleida Cuts. She is my favorite, Heather, over at Kaleida Cuts um, for religious Easter cutters. Uh, she just has the biggest selection and I think kind of the, the classiest ones, if I could say. Like this one in particular, I really liked this design um, with the shawl. The shawl, of course, is an important symbol for Easter. Um, so I am doing this entire set in a two consistency outline and flood. And I'm kind of, I'm leaning toward that, towards that these days. Um, I just, I'm doing more complex designs um and i prefer the two consistency when i'm doing the more complex designs because i'm often needing that second consistency anyway for whatever i'm doing for the design um and it is faster in a way to flood this way um and i do think it's more satisfying to watch now, all these squiggles I did here, that is to help prevent craters. It gives a little more stability in the base of the icing um, so that that flood is less likely to crater. Less likely. It is not a guarantee, my friends. I still say if you want to prevent craters, the best thing you can do is to use the thickest icing possible. Now, in this case, that is not the thickest icing possible in this application, um, which is why I definitely want to try to use those squiggles to help prevent the craters. Now, uh, typically I would let the outline of the cross dry first, and then I would do the squiggles and immediately flood after I do the squiggles. I don't like the squiggles to dry. I want them to be wet. I just think it kind of like marries together better. <laughs> um... I think in this case, I don't know if I let the outline of the cross dry or not, I can't, can't recall. But anyway, the point of the outline of the cross is, or any shape, is to hold the icing in, right? It's kind of like a fence um, to hold the icing in, and it's, it's more effective if it's dry. Now, this is Americolor Chocolate Brown Gel Coloring and this fan brush. I did not thin it at all, um, so it's very pigmented. This is honestly my favorite way to do wood grain. There are a lot of different ways out there. I, <laughs> in terms of execution, I like this one the best because I think it's the easiest. Um, there are other ways like with the actual icing that look really cool, but I'm uh, hashtag often too lazy <laughs> to mess with the, the color of the icing. And one thing you may want to do, which I'm not sure if I did or not on this, um, is that when you use pure gel food coloring, it tends to have a hard time drying on its own. It can usually, but it just takes a really long time. So especially if you're bagging these, you know, pretty quickly after they're done drying, after the icing's done hardening, um, the, the best way to combat the stickiness is to lightly brush the dried <laughs> the dried cookie with cornstarch 
Um, the only downside to that is that it tends to give a more matte finish to the icing in the end, um, which isn't terrible, especially considering the benefit that you no longer have the tackiness. Um, so it's always helpful, but just keep that in mind. And the way I brush it over is um, I just have a very fluffy, big fan brush or just any big fluffy brush is what I would recommend. You don't want something too hard that's going to like indent or like take up any of the color, if that makes sense. And here I am doing the squiggles again to help prevent craters. This white icing is so white um, because I did add some food coloring to it. I These days I always color my white icing uh, because even I who uses lemon juice, my icing is not quite a bright white. It's a slightly off white without any coloring in it. And I prefer to use, when I can, the Sugar Art Master Elite in white. That's a highly pigmented powder. The only downside to that is that you have to activate it with water first, um, which means that you're definitely going to be thinning your icing as you are adding the coloring. Um, and if your icing is already thin enough, then you don't want to thin it more, right? So if I'm in that scenario, then I will use, I have an Americolor white gel color which i will use um it still works i just don't think it's like quite as effective as the master elite now this here if this is too nerve-wracking to um freehand it like i'm doing here there is a drawing of this cutter so you could project the drawing onto the cutter and trace that Wait, maybe with an edible marker first or just directly pipe on um, to the image. But I <laughs> I tend to get really lazy about pulling out my projector and I only pull it out when I absolutely have to. I only made two of each design in this set except for the eggs. Um, and so I... I was like, well, I'm only making two, so it's not that much to stress about. Um, on the flip side to that, you could say, well, I'm only making two, so I only have two chances to get it right. Uh, clearly, I went with <laughs> flying by the seat of my pants. Now, what else can I say on this one? I'm doing a lot of flooding in sections here, which made this cookie take a long, long time. I think this is like a 10-minute cookie, which is exacerbated by what I decided to do after this. So I wasn't planning to do anything to the shawl. I was just gonna leave it flooded, plain white like this. But when I saw it finished, it just seemed too, too plain. Um, it was, you know, this design, I executed it, I believe, exactly like the drawing, but I thought the two pieces on the sides just looked like too too big, too white, too plain. So after, um, after the shawl dried, I added some more texture to the top, which we'll get to in a minuto. Um, something that's really important to also to prevent cratering is if you're ever doing a second layer like I'm doing here with the top of the shawl is you want to do that second layer when the first layer has just crusted enough to be strong enough to hold a second layer. So for me, I use a dehydrator, so that could be as quickly as 15 minutes in the dehydrator. Of course, let your cookie cool off when you take it out of the dehydrator before adding more icing to it. Um, if you don't use a dehydrator, it could be more like 30 minutes would be my guess. Um, it's, yeah, it would be, it's enough crusting, like if you're doing lettering on top. Uh, I don't know the exact science behind this, but it is something, something about the fact that the icing underneath has not yet dried. So as the two layers are kind of drying, at the same time <laughs> something about the bottom layer doesn't feel the need to like pull moisture away, away from the top and be be so selfish and because when the, <laughs> when the moisture kind of gets pulled away from the icing that's the icing drying that's when 
it sinks in the middle. That's when it craters. So this is what I'm doing here to add some texture to the shawl. And what I did was I just added um, the soft peak piping consistency on top of the flood. So I'm pretty sure, yeah, my consistencies that I used in this set for the, for the piping consistency, it's a soft peak. And then for the flood, it's my thin flood. If you don't know what I'm talking about, go check out my video on consistencies. Got a little something on there because <laughs> I was just picking it off. Um, so the first thing that I did was to use this bigger brush to just cover the surface. But I realized it wasn't leaving enough texture for my liking. And so what I did was after I got like a good layer on there from the bigger brush, then I took the smaller brush and kind of give it, gave it um, more distinct texture. And what worked here as well was that as the icing was starting to dry, starting to crust a little bit, it was giving even more texture because I think I found as well that my soft peak was pretty soft. Um, and if you're doing kind of like painting like this, you're going to get more texture with a thicker consistency. So that's kind of a trick. If you're trying to do this kind of texture thing and your icing is too thin, like if, even if you're using a flood or something, just kind of keep working with it or give it a second to dry. Uh, just, just a moment. Because um, as it starts drying, it'll have more, more body to it. Um, it's kind of hard to see probably in this lighting here just how much texture there is. You'll be able to see better in the photo at the end. And I just personally, I love how this one turned out. I wasn't, I did not expect this one to be one of my favorites. And I actually, I mean, I'm going to be honest here. I think a lot, of, a lot of the cookies in this set are some of my favorites that I've done. Um, I tend to shy away from doing too much detail um, I don't see it as my strong suit. I have a lot of strengths as a cookie artist. I don't see fine detail as one of them. And maybe still there isn't fine detail here, but I'm working with a lot of texture, which I do think is my forte. I am a big fan of texture to add dimension and interest in a design. You don't necessarily need to do super fine details, um, like super fine piping details to have a lot of interest. But these are a lot of complex designs, like a, many elements to them at least. And goodness, there are several cookies that are uh, like 8 to 10 minute range. There might even be one that's more than 10 minutes. Wait, this one's more than 10 minutes, friends. We are at 12 minutes and 50 seconds. Okay. <laughs> wow. <laughs> this was a labor of love. Um, one of the things that I started doing so that I... I could have more patience for more complex designs is only doing two of each complex design. So I made eight designs total in this set and the eighth one is intentionally a very simple design and that's the egg. And that's my plan from now on is that when I do sets like this, I will make sure that there is one very simple one that I can make a lot of. So I always make one batch of dough and I make however many cookies I can make out of one batch of dough, and that's my content. So I made two of each of the complex designs for this set, and then the rest of it I made in eggs, and I think I had maybe around eight eggs. Uh, so there we go, look at that. Oh God, I love the texture on that shawl. So good. All right, if you watched the sped up compilation, you'll notice that this part was not in the sped up compilation, mostly because I did not think it was very satisfying to watch. Um, but I did finally film myself doing this. Now I finally filmed myself doing this, but I'm doing it a new way and I don't like this way. I saw someone else do it like this. Not a fan, not a fan of my friends. So the, the approach here is to dab it with a paper towel. And I think the reasoning behind this is so it's, it's easier to not get too much of the gel coloring. This is just my Americolor white. Um, but I found the problem here was that it was a lot easier to like press down on the dough too much. Like you can tell on this one, I actually kind of pressed too much on the edge at the top and I had some issues getting the color onto cookies next to it because I didn't have much precision <laughs> with my paper towel. What I normally do is I paint a layer on just with a paintbrush. With that approach, 
it can be too easy to get too much gel coloring and if you have too much um, you're not going to get a nice crackle technique so the whole concept is that as the cookie cooks here as it bakes it expands and so that's where you get the crack fun from and if you have too much gel coloring on the surface um, then it the ice the the gel coloring will sink into the cracks and you won't get the beautiful crack technique so anyway um just a side note uh this here i think is i used the soft peak just to paint this on and because i wanted to make sure that i covered the cookie in icing that kind of preserves the whole surface of the cookie as i'm saying that i'm realizing i did not <laughs> obviously cover the whole top but anyway um this is that was a circle cutter that was roughly the right size it wasn't quite big enough but i wanted to have some sort of a guide to pipe that circle this is the Americolor Chocolate Brown again, just painting that on because um, I wanted it to be a darker brown than the brown I had made. And, you know, you could paint this directly onto the cookie, but I wanted to put some icing down first. Now we are doing a little outline action here. And this is a cookie where I modified the design ever so slightly. So... The change I made is that the design of this cookie um, on the bigger portion of the tomb has the word risen written on it. And since I chose to also do hand lettered plaque saying he is risen, I didn't feel like it was necessary to also put that on the tomb. And I felt like I could use a little more nature to it. Um, so you'll see in a minute that I actually added some moss. How cool is that? <laughs> um, I've only done Cookie Moss a couple of times, but I'm a big, a big fan. Now, I'm sure many people are dying to know how I made all of these colors, and I'm really sorry to say I have no idea. Um, I'm sorry. I, <laughs> I almost always use, reuse old icing that I've um, frozen and defrosted, and this is no exception. Um... So, right, I just lost my train of thought. Um, this taupe, though, it's, it's something like some chocolate brown mixed with some yellow. Like the tiniest bit of yellow, some ivory, and some black. Something to that effect. I know that's not super helpful, but um, that's just <laughs> how I work with colors. I start with something usually that I already have, um, or even if it's just starting like fresh, and then I mess with it. Uh, what I did there was like a super intense um, squiggle <laughs> on the little boulder opening to the tomb, because um, I didn't want this to crater. Now, the benefit of what I'm about to do after this is that if, you, if it did crater a little bit, it's going to kind of get masked by this here, which is what I call the bear technique. Now, I thought I used, oh no, this is piping consistency. Okay, I just, I just piped it really thick. So with the bear, uh, excuse me, bear technique, uh, you can have a lot of texture and you can have a little texture. If you're going for a little texture, you should use a flood consistency because it will just have, since it's thinner, it's not going to have quite as much dimension and texture to it. Um, if you want more texture, use a thicker consistency and use more of it. So in this case, I wanted like extra texture. I wanted extra height. So I used the thickest I had, which was a pretty soft, soft peak, and then a lot of icing. And you want to be pretty gentle with this, um, especially if, you're, <laughs> if your icing is not completely dried. I have definitely um, punctured some icing before doing this technique and I'm using a pretty big brush um, you want to use something preferably that's like round and fat um, like this here that has like a good amount of surface area to it that's the most ideal so just finishing up this bear and again I found this to be a little a little on the thin side for as much texture as I wanted so if I just kept playing with it as it started to dry I could get more and more height 
and it's a just it's a straight up and down motion that's the motion you're doing now here we are with a soft peak doing my little sun action here is my little sunrise and that's <laughs> that's just a very big version of a squiggle um, want to make sure I get plenty of icing in there going in with my flood and in this case so I did not wait for that outline to dry intentionally because then everything can melt together instead of being able to see that outline not necessary but just a side note and adding on my lines here Sometimes when I freehand something like this, um, you'll see me do it in what seems like a strange order. And this is just me visually spacing everything out. So I did the sides. I did the center. I will, I tend to divide the space in half. So here I am dividing the space in half, dividing it in half again, and then dividing that in half. I contemplated whether I should have done more sun rays than that, but here we are. It's done. Okay, now I have let this dry for the most part, and I'm going back in with my soft peak, and I'm laying the icing here that I'm going to cover in the moss. So what is the cookie moss? Now, some people actually use old cookies and um, blend them up, but I don't usually have old cookies, so I'll use graham crackers, and I put them in a blender or a food processor until it's pretty fine. And then in a bowl, in a small bowl, I will thin out gel food coloring mixed with Everclear. It's a really high proof alcohol. In this case, I mixed some sort of like leaf green and added extra yellow to it because I wanted it to be like a really yellow um, greenery green. <laughs> um, and I put the cookie crumbs in a Tupperware and then like one teaspoon at a time, I add in the, the diluted gel coloring. Um, it needs to be diluted, otherwise it won't cover everything. You don't want to use too much, otherwise your, your breadcrumbs or your cookie crumbs will get too dry, uh, too wet, excuse me. And in this case, I found that I needed to kind of press down the moss a little bit to get it to adhere better. Um, if you're, if you're doing a bigger area, you could just do a flood consistency with an outline to it. Um, but in this case, it was small and I wanted to be really precise about where I put the moss. So in this case, I'm just using a dry, unused paintbrush to um, brush off all the excess stuff. And this is where it's important to make sure that your icing is dry. If your icing is not dry, then you'll be pulling off the icing with the extra moss. And that's no good. Right, my friends? No good. So there we go. That is the tomb. Uh, also love the tomb. I mean... It's a tie right now for first place. Okay, this here is a little bit of a simpler design, uh, but also a big fan of this one. Uh, that previous cutter, by the way, was also Kaleida Cuts. This one here is an Ann Clark cookie cutter. It's just a solid leaf to have on hand. I've used this in many scenarios. And in this case, I was just going for a blank palette um, to put a... What is this? A palm. A palm leaf. Palm. I don't think it's called a leaf. I think there's another word for it. I might be wrong about that. Anyway, this is <laughs> to represent a palm palm leaf. We're going to say a palm leaf. Um, I thought about doing the white crackle on the base of this uh, instead of flooding it, but I figured I already have two designs with a white crackle beneath it, and... For content purposes, I wanted to have another flood because it's always good to have more flooding content. Am I right? I am right, my friends. Um, so we got some more flood here. Um, what else can I say about this one? I don't know if I have anything else to say at this moment. Uh, what we're doing on top is all done with piping consistency. It's a soft peak. So not really as necessary to make sure that I'm doing that um, when the, the base is just barely crusted. And that is because I'm using a piping consistency. And if you're, as long as it's a true piping consistency, it's not going to crater. It's the floods that are going to crater. So um, you know, if you're going to do a larger leaf using flood consistency, then I would make sure that your base is not fully dried yet. But I didn't need to be as concerned about that with this one. 
So just piping my, my clean line on there. And then this is a form of pressure piping, I believe. I'm honestly not always sure what exactly is pressure piping, but we're going to call this pressure piping. Uh, <laughs> where I am applying a good amount of pressure on that bag as I am, like, icing. It's, it's almost like I'm doing a flood technique, but with piping consistency if that makes sense. And this is actually harder than it looks to make it look even because um, your hand's going to jiggle and you can kind of see that my hand has jiggled a little bit based on excuse me each individual font fa <laughs> what is this called? Oh my goodness. Ooh. Palm. palm. I keep wanting to call it a fern. It is not a fern. It is a palm. <sighs> okay. Um... It's a little more forgiving, this kind of technique, with this soft peak that I'm doing, because it's like settling ever so slightly as I am piping. And I'm just using my scribe to kind of encourage the tips down. Now, finishing off the ends is a little challenging because you are releasing pressure as you're pulling away at the same time. And you want to make sure you keep your bag level to the surface if you pull up too much then you're going to get kind of a pulled up peak which is what I got on some of them which is why I needed to use the scribe to help encourage it down and I don't know I really so I did a palm leaf whatever this is and a palm cross um and I really wanted both of the symbolism in this because, you know, obviously the palm cross is very familiar because that's what's used or that's what's made on Palm Sunday um, with dried. Are they dried? No. Anyway, goodness, palm cross. And that's like in, in remembrance of what, it, what actually happened. But these palm leaves were actually um, used when when Jesus entered um, the city and they were placed at his feet and that's the symbolism of it. But anyway, <laughs> um, I wanted to use, but I, I thought it could use like some more life and greenery in this set, um, which is why I wanted to make sure I did both versions of the palm. So up next we have our first hand lettered plaque. I have two hand lettered plaques in this set. Again, when you buy a cookie cutter, uh, it has an, it inherently has a design on it, unless it's a basic shape, like a circle or a square or a heart or something like that. But if it's something like this, it has a design to it, which the person who made and sold the cookie cutter did themselves. And when you buy the cookie cutter, you buy the rights to use that design. So in this case, it is hand lettering. So by purchasing the cutter, I've purchased the rights to recreate the hand lettering and the way I do that is I just project the image of the the sketch from the website um, of the cookie on to the cookie <laughs> um, and in this case like doing a, a shape like this that has a lot of nooks and crannies to it uh, doing a two consistency outline in flood is much more forgiving um, it's easier to get all of those nooks and crannies as long as you are comfortable with outlining. So just a side note there, you know, if I did, the, if I did a one consistency on this, then, um, it just wouldn't have as crisp of an edge to it. That's all. Uh, in terms of this color, oi, how did I get this color? Oi, I don't know. Uh, <laughs> it's, it's got to be some mix of like autumn gold from the Sugar Art Master Elites with some egg yellow with like a little bit of lemon yellow. Um, yeah. Now this is also a Kaleidicuts cutter. And I was going to say something else. Oh, it's kind of on the big side. I mean, all these cookies for the most part are like are standard size. Um, so it's a pretty big surface to flood. All the more reason to use a thinner flood and do two consistencies here because 
the thicker the consistency, the faster it will crust. So the thicker your flood is, the faster it will crust and the less time you have to work with it until it crusts. And it's very frustrating when that happens. When you get to the center, you're done flooding and you realize that the edges have already started to crust and they have not like married into each other. Very frustrating. So I'm just using my scribe on all the sharp corners to make sure that my icing got to them sufficiently. In that moment, I was trying to decide if I actually needed to shake the cookie or not. And I decided, yes, yes, Grace, I'm going to shake the cookie. Okay. Now this was challenging because I'm going to be doing lettering on top of this that I wanted to do while the cookie was still, you know, not totally dry. But then I was doing, going to do watercolor first, which is what I'm doing here. And I was terrified that, um, if I did it when the cook, when the icing was not totally dry, that it would like create holes in the icing <laughs> from the water. But anyway, so this is the sugar art masterly in red rose. So a powder mixed with water. And I just kind of had two different, uh, oh, opacities pigments of it <laughs> one much lighter which is what I started with and then much darker um, which I'm just giving another layer of it here um, I was going for a sunset in case anyone could not tell uh, you know he is risen sunset and this is that hand lettering I was talking about love a good hand lettered plaque um, cause it makes, it makes the design very easy, right? Cause like it's already a design. I feel like if you put lettering on a basic shape, you need to do a little bit more to it to make it feel like it's a finished cookie. Now in this case, I could have just done this on the yellow surface, but I wanted to add a little more pizzazz, a little more design to the cookie. So I did that, uh, watercolor. Uh, what I also did, and it looks like I did not film, is that I did do cornstarch on top of this because especially that red at the bottom, all that coloring is not going to dry all that well or all that quickly. So definitely brush it with some cornstarch after it's had a decent chance to dry on its own. And something I get asked a lot is like, how do you prevent your hand covering your projector. I do not have an easy answer to this because as you can see, my hand is covering part of the image. It's just kind of how it goes. Um, there, It is possible to make it a little bit better versus worse. Um, <laughs> there was one time I was decorating and like my hand was covering the entire image as I was decorating. And I was like, what is the point of using this projector? Cause I'm basically just guessing <laughs> where everything is. And I can't, I think I was in a hurry and I didn't have the patience to figure out why it wasn't the right angle. I don't know, but just mess with it. Y'all mess with it. I have two different projectors. I have, um, the kind of what we call the Pico in cookie world. Um, it's the most common, um, and probably the least expensive projector that's out there. It's usually like between 120 and 150, I think. Um, don't quote me on that. But I find that the image is not quite as crisp and uh, it's, it's very finicky when it comes to like charging and battery. So I ended up getting a second projector. I actually thought I'd be using it for classes and then it never ended up doing that, but um, I like it better. This is what I call my Bluetooth. They're both linked in the description. Um, this has a crisper image and you don't have to use cords to, to connect, which I like connect to the, my iPad. Um, here, I just want to say I'm putting, this is again to prevent cratering, um, an extra line in that center of the lettering to give it a little more stability. And I am flooding right away and I'm using a flood consistency here. Um, sometimes I try to do this kind of puffy lettering all with a soft peak and it is less likely to crater, but I don't have the patience always or really ever <laughs> to um, help it to settle enough because you have to give it a lot of encouragement when you're using a soft peak to settle enough smooth. So just a slide note there. Uh, this color too, I don't know what this color is. 
what is this color oh so i started with a purple and what i originally wanted was like was like a bluish purple and i ended up more with like a periwinkle which is like a blue with a tiny bit of purple um and i didn't really realize that until i had bagged the icing that it was skewed more blue than purple oh well i still love it um i think it's a great color but the impetus behind this color in the first place was I was doing a crocus and crocuses are usually more purple <laughs> than they are blue. There are blue crocuses out there. Um, but yeah. So I don't know how helpful I was with that. <laughs> um, this is my favorite scribe for super fine detail. This is the PME scribe it's in my amazon shop i think it's linked in the description i have three different scribes i always use they have three different sized ends to them for different applications and the other key to this kind of lettering is to make sure that you're really like almost not over flooding it, but you're flooding it to the absolute capacity. And you're actually kind of flooding on top of that outline instead of inside of the outline. That's how you're going to not really see much of an outline. <laughs> there we go. Sorry. Just <laughs> um, okay. Now we are on to the crocus. Alrighty, so we are back at it with our crackle, you can see on the right, maybe, maybe not. Um, I accidentally did this on the entire other tomb that I did, so I did two of them. I didn't need to do the entire cookie, whoops, um, but that was fine because I covered the rest of the cookie in icing, uh, so no one needed to know, but anyway. Okay, uh, yeah, I'm never doing this technique again. I had a couple of instances where, I mean, using the, the paper towel, I'm definitely going to go back to painting. Um, I had a couple of instances where I got coloring on another cookie next to it. It was so frustrating. I, ha frustrating. I had to get it off. Um, I mean, if I wasn't filming everything, it wouldn't matter. Uh, it would be <laughs> totally fine because it's going to get covered with icing anyway. But since I film everything, I wanted to make sure there was a nice surface. Anyway, um, trying to remember here if I left this part in. I made a mistake when I started this one. Yes, it looks like I left this in. So I, or I didn't make a mistake. So I started piping and, and... I get a, oh, I get a clog or something awful. So my like icing did not adhere. I kind of wish that I had just left it because it would have been fine. But no, I decided to take it off and I just say no because this was my second cooking. I was like, oh, as I did this, I just died inside a little bit. <sighs> but I'm glad I left this on the video so you can see how I fixed it. Oh, God. All right. <laughs> so clearly the white is dry. And I tried to take the icing off first. Now, what would have been better is if I had let that blue crust. And then you can kind of just like, it comes off a lot cleaner and a lot easier. Um, I'm not sure why. <laughs> I guess I took this off the camera. Um, if you can see in the middle, there's a tiny piece of tape. And that tiny piece of tape is actually my marker, which I only just started using. I would, I would frame every single time I did a new clip, the cookie with, um, uh, with a paper towel to figure out where it needs to go. Uh, and then I realized that I could just mark it with a little piece of tape and, um, yeah. Anyway. Okay. So I cleaned this up as much as I could. You saw me at the beginning using a scribe to mark the bottom of the uh, crocus, which I, I preferred to do that instead of a marker because I don't know. It's if you use a marker, you just have to triply make sure that you cover the entire marking, which makes sense, but sometimes it's hard. I don't know. Uh, okay, this is a soft peak, and 
Um, this is this is a style that I'm rocking here, which is that you do a design and you leave a border of the cookie. This cutter was design not designed that way. It was it's meant to actually go all the way to the edge, but I really liked this crackle idea um, to cover the empty space and you'd just be able to see more of it if I left a border. So that's what I've done here. I was really struggling. So I think what's happening is that my icing was having issues adhering to the crackle because it's probably a little bit smoother than a cookie surface. And if you've ever tried to pipe on like a piece of paper, it's very challenging because there's, it's a very smooth surface and it's challenging to adhere to that surface. So just outlining all of my sections here and doing my squiggle to prevent the craters. And you'll see when this dries, I think I still got the slightest craters in the, the crocus flowers themselves. Excuse me. But that's where I added in a little something extra, which you will see in a momento. Um, I really believe <laughs> that as you get better at probably anything, but particularly as you get better with royal icing, I mean, your technique does get better, but... You also just get better at covering your boo-boos, covering your mistakes. Uh, and for me, one of those things is craters. So yes, I do get less craters than I used to, but I've also just gotten better at covering them up. So like that bear technique back there with the tomb, great technique to distract from craters, friends. Um, I'm gonna be putting some lines in, in the middle of these sections, which is gonna cover up craters. Uh, you can also use, you could do like a crackle technique in a small area that you think is gonna crater. Just a side note. Um, okay, this here was a completely like gratuitous, <laughs> not necessary little extra thing I decided to add in here. Um, I wish I had made it bigger, the little white bit, because when it, um, the last finishing touch I'm gonna add, is the little yellow things in the middle and they end up covering most of the white. Won't won't. So just a side note. This is another cookie that's like kind of simple in a way. I don't know if simple is the right word, but it takes a long time because there's so much flooding in sections. I suppose if you didn't want to take this much time, you could just flood the entire like the crocus, you could flood the whole shape and then just add outlines on top to give it the shape. But I was really into the flooding in sections, so that's what I did. Now I think I'm just gonna leave you here until I'm um, at the end of this cookie. See you in a minute.
Now everything has dried and I'm going in and adding this little detail on top, which I wasn't planning to do, but if I recall, um, there was the slightest craters, which you can't really see all that well at this angle on the, the crocuses and I wanted to distract from that. So this is a pretty common like detail to add, add on top of leaves and that kind of thing. So I just thought I would roll with it. This is all soft peak piping consistency. And there are the little, I don't know if that's a bud. I don't know how, that's not a very accurate bud for a crocus, but whatever. Um, side note on the crocus choice. So I know that white lilies are more common and obvious choice for Easter. Uh, excuse me, not white, well, Easter lilies. They're called Easter lilies. But for me personally, this was an Easter set that kind of represented the Easter of my childhood. And for me, um, my mom's garden always had crocuses and daffodils. Um, I was going to do both, but decided just to do crocuses. Um, and I'm glad I did. I just think they're, they're so pretty and they're just like these bright little bursts coming out of the tiny little bursts coming out of the ground and just really like them. So anyway, um, that's the crocus. Moving on. So this actually was a design that I decided to do last minute and I didn't have a plain cross cutter. So I had another cross. I mean, you could certainly completely hand cut this, but I had another cross that um, just had a little extra greenery on it. And so I cut that first and then I used a knife to cut out the corners to make it just a plain cross. Now, what I had meant to do, because this is ultimately becoming a palm cross, what I meant to do was actually, um, those corners were not supposed to be perpendicular corners. I was supposed to have left them, you know, because the palm cross has the crisscross in the center of the palm holding the, the cross together, if I'm making any sense here, if you know what I'm talking about. Um, I wish I had not, I wish I had left a little bit of extra cookie dough at those corners to make more room for that crisscross. And I was, I didn't realize this until after I baked the cookies and I was like, oh, fudge. <sighs> um, so I, I may do it, thank goodness. But anyway, just a side note. Um, you might be wondering why I didn't do the squiggles on this. And um, it's because I forgot. I'm sorry, I was just taking a drink of water. That happens to me a lot because I'm not as used to doing the squiggles. And so I often forget. I did a one consistency outline and flood for so long. Um, but I knew that it was going to be okay if it did crater a little bit because I'm adding a lot of extra dimension on top of this. So what I'm doing here is I wanted this to look like a palm leaf or whatever it's called. Um, and they're like a little yellowish green. So I flooded the yellow and I'm using the soft peak piping consistency and I'm just, um, I had a little dab of it on a plate or something and I'm just taking a little bit at a time to add texture. I had tried the flood, the yellow flood first, but it wasn't giving me enough texture and I wanted like another layer of color and texture on this one. So here we go. Uh, sorry, I just lost my train of thought. No, I, I got lost in watching myself. Okay. Um, 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 this is leaf green gel color. I don't know if, if it's Wilton or Americolor. It doesn't really matter. Um, I think they're about the same. And again, that's my fan brush, my trusty fan brush technique. And I did not dilute the color at all. So again, this if this had cratered a little bit, that wouldn't have been the end of the world because I was adding a lot of distraction on top. So this is where I kind of had to force the these extra corners. Um, I did kind of intentionally over flood that base just a little bit so that those corners would soften and not be quite so harsh perpendicular corners. So again, this is a moment where I wanted to make sure I was doing this detail 
on top before that green base had completely flooded to help prevent craters. I hope you all have learned a lot about craters in this set. <laughs> and here we go. Now I'm giving it the same treatment as the rest of the cross. I make a mistake though, cause I was filming this and just kind of like lost my brain for a minute. Um, the mistake is that I should have let this yellow dry and did the green on top of it and then did the other crisscross. Um, but you're gonna see me in a minute, lose my brain and uh, go straight to, yep, flooding the other crisscross. And the reason why that was kind of a mistake is because it just makes it a little more challenging when I go to do the green on top to not accidentally also paint on top of the crisscross in the wrong way. So just a side note, my friends. Um, yeah, that's all I got, okay. <laughs> Um, not the end of the world, certainly, but I just, I didn't realize until I started doing the other crisscross, I was like, oh no, Grace. Um, there are quite a few techniques that like, it's easier to do them in sections as you go instead of waiting until the end. Like here I'm, oh, I'm crossing my fingers. See, I got a little bit on the extra crisscross, um, but not the end of the world. I really liked this like painting on top of the flood. I do this actually in, in a variety of ways in the set. I didn't really think about that. I did it on the shawl. I did like a dabbing technique on the tomb. I'm doing it here, painting with a wide brush, adding these final finishing touches. This one I used so little gel coloring, I actually didn't feel like I needed to um, do the cornstarch on top. Just a, just a side note there. So that one is done. Now we are on to the egg. Now I did make this egg in four different colors because I just wanted to make sure I had maximum color variety and I'm really glad I did it in four different colors because I needed to use those eggs to fill out the frame of my photos and if they were all the same color, then it would have looked kind of strange. But anyway, um, this is uh, the Brighton Cutters egg. I actually, this is the same egg that I used in my Easter Bunny set, side note. Um, this is the same color as the tomb. Just did a simple outline and do my flood. I firmly believe it's extremely important to always have at least one extremely simple design in a set for two reasons. One reason, I think it is just visually appealing to have something simple, contrast something complex. Second reason is for your sanity, my friends. Um, <laughs> it's always good to have something simple because it's going to take less time, right? So balance out all those crazy complicated ones with something that's like super fast. I mean, this was a two minute cookie. So the next thing I'm doing is I'm using, um, this is again, Americolor chocolate brown thinned with the tiniest bit of water, I think, uh, doing a splatter technique on it. This is one way to do a splat splatter where you tap the paintbrush. Another way is to actually use your fingers and fli flick the paintbrush. If you're gonna do that, please use gloves. I never have the patience to do that. I don't know. Um, I think you get a finer splatter if you do the, the finger technique. Um, but I'm okay with like the chunkier splatter of this one. <laughs> Alrighty, friends, we are on to the last cookie of the set. Who's sad? I'm a little sad, but this is also kind of a long video. So, um, this is the last hand lettered, second and last hand lettered plaque, also by Kaleida Cuts. This one says, holy. Um, and I wanted to keep this one simple, friends, beautifully simple. So all I'm doing is I'm outlining, I'm flooding, and I'm going to do some more lettering on top in the same way that I did the risen part of the He Has Risen. So I think I'm just going to leave you here until I get to the end of the cookie. 
Enjoy watching this.
already here. We're coming up on the end of this gorgeous cookie. Um, you have noticed that I used my scribe a lot to finesse the letters. Um, and I'm a firm believer in only using scribes when absolutely necessary. And this is necessary, friends. Okay, well, not extremely necessary, but it definitely makes it look better. Um, this is where you can kind of encourage it, especially to those corners. Cover up as much of that outline as you possibly can. And there we go. That is the holy cookie. That's the last cookie in the set. And that is the entire set, my friends. Wow, what a whirlwind. I really, I really enjoyed designing this set, putting this set together. I hope you enjoyed watching this video. I hope you learned a thing or two, maybe even try one of these designs this year, next year, what have you. Um, I love sharing my love of cookies with you. So <laughs> hope you enjoyed this and have a sweet one.